It's a pleasure to be here with you. If I had my way, I would just sit and listen to everyone in the room to learn about climate change. I'm here to impart in this very brief overview, since I'm used to giving eight-hour talks, um, the take-home points that perhaps can set um, a common vocabulary. Because this is such a diverse group, and um, I'm assuming there's a, a range of people who know a tremendous amount about the brain and other people who know that the brain is in the skull, um, and there's everyone in between. Um, I'm going to start with the, the basic notions. Um, there is an extensive set of uh, publications, so uh, the, the scientific publications. I publish a, a, a professional series called the Norton Series on Interpersonal Neurobiology, which is uh, 15 textbooks that I've edited. And there's a book starting with The Developing Mind that's available. There's a book called The Mindful Brain. These are books I've authored, and this late, latest one called um, Mindsight. And those would all have background. So what my intention is for this talk is to just start as if of just building a foundation that can begin a conversation for this very important meeting that we're all having. Myself, um, I actually have to go to another meeting tomorrow, so I will only be here till the, this evening. So if there's something that comes up and you want to grab me, that today is the day to be grabbing uh, so we can have conversations. So I'm going to be talking to you about a uh, triangle that we'll be referring to over and over again that can help us understand the relationship among three uh, fundamental things that usually aren't put together, um, but we'll put them together. And this is a triangle that looks at relationships mind and brain. And when I say brain, I really mean the embodied nervous system, but we'll just call that the brain. So what I'd like you to think about as we get started on this is what in the world could connect these three entities, relationships, mind, and brain. And by beginning here, we can actually make sure we're on a very common footing. So when you think about climate change and you think about human behavior, um, we have to understand that behavior is not just coming from a single human being, but it's embedded within a relationship and set of relationships that we call either family or community or culture. So at UCLA, um, I help run a program called the Center for Culture, Brain, and Development, which you can look at what we do at cbd.ucla.edu, where we're very interested in how relationships shape the connections within the brain as a child and an adolescent and even adult develop. And so you can see some the kind of research we, we uh, promote there. But what I want you to think about is why would these three things be related? What is a relationship, actually? Whether it's the one you have with people sitting at the table you're at, or what are relationships within a culture, which is what we study in anthropology. What is the brain? And in fact, what is the mind? So that's where we're going to start. And if I do this well in 20 minutes, um, we'll be able to at least get a vocabulary going. And what I hope to do as we step through this is try to have take-home points about how this might relate to climate change issues. But that's your field, and you can teach me about it, so I'm just making guesses. So you may find all sorts of areas where that's relevant. So the question is, how are these related to each other? The first time I ever drew this, I was working in Poland. We, we had a whole program to uh, help um, therapists work uh, in the former Soviet bloc countries. And I drew this, and one of my co-faculty members said, Dan, you are insane. And I said, why am I insane? He goes, you put relationships and brain on the same slide. And they, they shouldn't even be in the same talk, and not even in the same thought. You know, what, why would you put them together? So I said, well, you know, the fact is that this, the brain, which is easy to define, right? The brain has 100 billion basic cells encased in the skull that are intimately interwoven with the entire nervous system, right? the basic neuron. And if there are 100 billion of them, the thing that makes it especially complicated is that each single neuron, which is a cell body and a long axonal length that goes out, has synaptic connections to other neurons. And if I'm an average neuron, which my mother never wanted me to be average, but if I were an average neuron, then how many connections am I making to other neurons? How many? 10,000. 
So who's good at math? 100 billion neurons, 10,000 connections, trillions of synaptic connections, let alone the other kinds of cells in the brain are called glia. They support the neurons, and they do all sorts of other things we're learning about. So there are trillions of connections in a spider web-like interconnected framework just in the skull. And that skull-based nervous system has extensive interconnections to the body. For example, there are networks around the heart and the intestine that profoundly influence behavior and reasoning. Right? So the nervous system in the gut and the heart actually process information. It's a PDP model. Parallel distributed processor is able to, when we make computers, for example, in a PDP fashion, it can actually reason and make decisions and learn. So we have learning modules in the heart, around the heart, in the intestine. We also have an extensive immune system and hormonal system. So in many ways, just to push this point home, the brain always means an embodied brain. We never talk about the brain up here. That wouldn't make any sense to talk about the thing in the skull without talking about the entire body. And it turns out that things like emotion have a central source, like a spring, that actually comes from the body itself. So when you think about a person's decision to purchase items in a store that are helping the environment or not, those decisions are driven literally by their body even though the hand going out is cortically driven, as you'll see in a moment. So we'll talk about the structure of the brain very soon. OK, so if the brain is allowing energy flow to pass through these um, synaptic connections among neurons, energy flow, one of the ways we talk about the brain as it relates to climate change, for example, is that the brain makes maps. This is a common neuroscientific term. It's making a map. So right now, for example, you have a visual map of me going like this with my hand. Right? In my hands, you have a map. You have a map in your brain of your own body with self-awareness sitting there in the chair. And you might have a map or not of your relationship with the planet. So one uh, take-home message about maps is that if an individual doesn't have a map-making capacity about their relationship to the Earth, they won't be making decisions that are helpful to climate change. So one simple take-home point there is we need to have experiences which create maps of Earth-relatedness, just to make up a term. Without that, it's irrelevant what's happening with the planet. With it, it's vital. So you can have two people sitting at a table. One doesn't care. The other is devoting their life to helping the planet. It's, you could just, if you could get in their brains, you would see one has a map of Earth-relatedness, the other doesn't. The maps determine what we do. And maps are literally real estate in the brain devoted to certain perceptual processes. And we can actually study them. You can study, for example, if you're playing piano, you'll have maps for your fingers um, that are a certain size. And the more you practice, the larger the maps get. So it is a real estate process in the brain. You can study a person who plays violin who has a much bigger map for the subtle movements of their left hand than the right hand map for just doing the bow. This is all studyable, and it's the way we talk about change. So the second take home point about the brain is that throughout the lifespan, not just in childhood, not just in adolescence, but throughout the lifespan, the brain is continually changing itself. And the book I refer you to for that is Norman Doidge's fantastic book, The Brain That Changes Itself. And Norman and, I are going, Norman and I are going around the country. We're doing a nine-city tour. Um, my students want us to call it the Magical Mystery Tour, but we're calling it the Neuroplasticity Tour. Um, and you, you're welcome to come. We'll be in New York, actually, in June or wherever you are, because I know you're from all over the country. And you can, you can see us spend two days literally just diving into this concept of how do you get a, an adult's brain's maps to change. So please join us. And, uh, we can make the conversation about climate change as we go.